What's happening, everybody? On today's show, a happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there as we get you caught up on the latest news going on around the conference. Bama benches their punt returner. Spencer Rattler still undecided on his 2024 plans. And we'll catch up with Stephen Willis of Locked On Ole Miss to preview tonight's Egg Bowl. Locked On SEC starts right now. You are Locked On SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And what is up, everybody? Welcome into Locked On SEC. It's great to have you guys along. I'm Chris Gordy. Thanks for making Locked On SEC your first listen every day. Uh, shout out to our everydayers. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. Plenty to discuss. Let's dive into it. Let's go around the conference. Boots out to the right. Takes the handoff. Around the conference. We start over at Alabama as Kool-Aid McKinstry, who's been handling punt returning duties for the majority of the season. Uh, Nick Saban benched him last Saturday against Chattanooga after he fumbled a long return. Uh, Saban decided to go with Caleb Downs in that spot, and Caleb Downs returned one for a touchdown. Uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry saying this week, I'm just here for the team. Whenever my number's called, that's when I'll step up. Caleb did a good job this weekend. Felt like he stepped up and into the role, did a great job with scoring the touchdown, just going out there and making sure he does well for the team. But when my number's called, I'll be ready. So Alabama, I'm sure we'll stick with Caleb Downs in that punt returner spot over Kool-Aid McKinstry. Now, CBS Sports football analysts, they are uh, they were making their picks for the Iron Bowl this weekend, and they were all in agreement. Randy Cross said that uh, Alabama's defense will be too much for Auburn. So I'm going to start with the defense, specifically the Alabama defense. Auburn had just 213 yards against New Mexico State. What do you think Bama's going to do to them? Uh, Rick Neuheisel said the Iron Bowl is a staple to end the college season. I'll take the roll tighters for a myriad of reasons. And lastly, Brian Jones said in the SEC, it just means more. Apparently at New Mexico State as well. The rival Bama showing up. Auburn will show up, but to no avail. Alabama will win. So they were all in consensus that Alabama will win the Iron Bowl this weekend. Over at Georgia, their dominance the last two seasons doesn't matter to the college football playoff committee, according to a report from Dennis Dodd. Uh, Dodd reporting that the college football playoff committee will not look at factors like Georgia winning the last two championships when it comes to picking the final four. The playoff committee will focus on this season and this season alone. Uh, but luckily for Georgia, they're undefeated. They've been dominant, and uh, again, if they went out, they should get in. Now, things get hairy if they lose to Bama in the SEC title game, but we'll dissect that stuff when we get to next week. Joel Klatt over at Fox Sports, he was talking on his podcast about uh, three teams that could cause Georgia some trouble. He said, I think Ohio State, Texas, and Oregon, all three of those teams are teams that are best built to match up with Georgia, not beat but match up with. He said, I look at these three teams. They're all good enough at the line of scrimmage and on both sides of the ball. So we'll see if George ends up beating one of those in the playoff. Meanwhile, over at Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin doing his weekly radio show ahead of the Egg Bowl tonight. And uh, Lane Kiffin talking about the cowbells and preparing for them. He said, we've played it on the loudspeakers, very loud during practice the whole time, which is annoying. He said he's coached in other conferences where news, noisemakers were banned, but he was informed about the rule for Mississippi State is that if they stop ringing them once the opponent comes to the line of scrimmage, they're allowed. Fans are prohibited from ringing the bells from the time the offensive center is over the football until the play is whistled dead. And uh, as they say, ring responsibly. <laughs> Lane Kiffin uh, letting his opinion known. He said, that's a dumb rule. Nobody's going to follow that. So it should be a good one tonight. 6.30 Central on ESPN, Rebels and Bulldogs. Over at South Carolina, Shane Beamer and company looking for one more win. This one against Clemson. This would get them to bowl eligibility. And their offense coordinator, uh, Dole Loggins, talking this week about some advice they got from former Gamecock quarterback Connor Shaw. He was the quarterback from 2011 to 2014. And uh, he wrote about 
the team's matchup this weekend against Clemson. He led uh, South Carolina to an 11-2 record and uh, was a very good quarterback for the Gamecocks. Loggins said, Shaw, when Loggins was the quarterback coach uh, for the Cleveland Browns, obviously saw him there. He said he wrote how much he appreciates the guy's representation of the Block C and what it is to be a Gamecock. It was really cool to come in and see that note from a guy that is as tough as I've ever coached. He's a gamer, an unbelievable person. Loggins said that Connor Shaw had high praise for Spencer Rattler throughout this season. He said to get his approval of how Spencer has played this year is probably more important than my approval of Spencer. This is a guy that's walked in his shoes, walked the walk, and played at a very high level. Uh, Spencer is extremely professional. He cares about his teammates deeply and doesn't get tired of doing the right thing. He's on time. He's prepared. He's the leader of the team. So we'll see if Spencer Rattler can get one more win for the Gamecocks. Now, what are his plans for next year? Senior quarterback still has another year of eligibility. He did accept an invite to the Reese's Senior Bowl, and uh, he was asked about his future. He said, I'm focused on this game, obviously, on Saturday. Got to take care of that first. Could be my last time out there. You never know. I've got another year of eligibility as well. I'm ready to play out there with my team, finish out strong, and have a good time. So, like, if he already accepted the invite to the Senior Bowl, writing maybe on the wall that Spencer Adler is going pro, but we'll see. NIL money is good. He could maybe get some money to come back, play one more year at South Carolina. They're five and six. Again, a win over Clemson Saturday night would get them to a bowl uh, bowl game. And other SEC news, obviously, Jaden Daniels is uh, vying for that vaunted Heisman and Chris Doring making a case for Jaden Daniels this week. He appeared on the next round with Jim Dunaway, and uh, he said, look, without – Jaden Daniels, LSU probably has five or six losses this season. He said that Daniels has been number one on his Heisman list since late September, early October. He said, all you got to do is turn the tape on. He's playing at a different speed than everybody else on the defense. He makes really good DBs look like middle schoolers. He said Daniels has great feel for the passing game as he continues to put up ridiculous numbers. Doring said, I don't know about you guys, but I can't remember the last time a team had three 100-yard receivers in a game. Daniels just did that. He can beat you in a lot of ways, and he's playing at his best right now. He said, every criteria you talk about leads me back to him being number one in the Heisman race, which, of course, calls for the most outstanding player, most valuable player, team player. Uh, Chris Doring saying that is what Jaden Daniels is. Meanwhile, over at Kentucky, they're preparing for their game against the Louisville Cardinals, and uh, Deion Walker kind of adding some fuel to the fire. Ahead of this game, the defensive lineman was asked what he thinks about the Cardinals heading into week 13. He said, I, quote, I never liked Louisville, even when I was getting recruited. I just don't like the Cardinals. Their fans are kind of snobbish, and their players act entitled. A lot of pent-up aggression towards them. So uh, we'll see what Deion Walker is able to do this week. He has over 40 tackles, five and a half sacks, and a couple of passes uh, defended. So we'll see what he does against Louisville. Kentucky, an underdog against Louisville. Over at Florida, Mike Norvell, uh, Florida State coach, talking with reporters on Wednesday. He was asked about going to Gainesville this weekend. He said uh, uh, FSU has experience playing in other hostile environments. This one will be tough. He said, I've never been there at night, so I really don't know what that atmosphere is going to be like. I'm sure it's going to be very hostile. Playing at Clemson was very hostile. They're pretty good there, but ultimately we're not going to be able to control the atmosphere. We know it's going to be loud. If we go and play the way we're capable, then those things will take care of themselves. Uh, we'll see two backup quarterbacks in this one. It'll be Max Brown for Florida with Graham Mertz out, and it'll be Tate Rotemaker for FSU in for the injured Jordan Travis. And over at Arkansas, they saw one of their uh, players enter the transfer portal, defensive back Jalen Lewis. Announced on social media, he is entering the portal. Says so thankful for his time at Univer the University of Arkansas, but he will be hitting the portal. He was the number 53 overall corner in last year's class. And one more SEC nugget here. The uh, SEC has a pair of linebackers on the Butkiss Award finalists. Missouri's Tyron Hopper and Mississippi State's Nathaniel Bookie Watson are finalists for the Butkiss. So, uh, shout out to those guys. Let's see if they are able to get it done. That is, uh, you're all caught up on all the news going on around the conference. Thank you guys for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Coming up next, we're going to talk with our buddy Stephen Willis, host of Locked on Ole Miss. We'll preview the Egg Bowl with him happening tonight. Happy Thanksgiving to all you guys. That's coming your way here in just a sec. 
Rolling along here, Locked On SEC. Thank you guys so much for making us your first listen every day. And shout out to our everydayers checking us out for a uh, Thanksgiving edition of Locked On SEC. And it's a big one because we got a game tonight. We got a Thursday game and a Friday game as we typically do this time of year in the SEC. But it is Egg Bowl time. And it's time to chat with our buddy Stephen Willis, of course, host of Locked On Ole Miss. Uh, follow him on Twitter at the Stephen Willis, Stephen with a V. Stephen, welcome in, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. We got some Egg Bowl tonight. You know, some people don't like the Thanksgiving game um, between Ole Miss and State. I love the fact that my day just ends with Ole Miss and Mississippi State. I realize that next year, you know, there's no announcement or anything. They're going to go to Texas and Texas A&M, and I get that and I understand that. So I'm just going to enjoy tonight as much as I can. Yeah, it's, you know, it, for years it was, uh, what was it, the, the Texas A&M would always play on Thanksgiving night. Mm -hmm. and. You know, you had all these different games, but the Egg Bowl has just been, it's been so fun because I, I had a, our buddy Chris Marler was on with us earlier this week, and we were debating some of the biggest rivalries, and I still think that it's the, uh, you know, the Iron Bowl is still number one, but the Egg Bowl is a close number two because these both, these fan bases hate each other. I remember, you know, Dan Mullen, when he was at Mississippi State, wouldn't even refer to uh, Ole Miss by name. I mean, it's, th this is a passionate rivalry. Yeah, it's one of those things to where even if you take the numbers away from the front of the teams to where the games to the national audience can mean absolutely nothing. I don't know if there's another game in college football to means as much to the prospective rivals as this one. I mean, you could have two, four and six teams going at it and it just doesn't matter. It's going to have the same level of hate that it would if both teams are 10 and one. Talk to me a little bit about uh, Ole Miss so far this season. I mean, it has been a, a, a fantastic year. Um, you know, only the two losses and, you know, to the two best teams in the SEC, to Georgia and Alabama. Outside of that, you know, you, you survive a scare and a shootout with LSU. But nine wins, a chance to go 10 and two for the second time in three years. This would be a huge feather in the cap for Lane Kiffin. Yeah, I think if you told Ole Miss at the beginning of the year, hey, you're going to lose two games and they're going to be in Athens and in Tuscaloosa, I'm pretty sure that everybody would have been okay with that. But, you know, Ole Miss has to take that next step. And unfortunately for Ole Miss, the, the, this next step is going to be the hard step. It's the game where these games at Texas, these games with Alabama and Georgia, the gap shrinks way down. The, that's the step that they need to get to. Um, and, We'll see it with Ole Miss fans as they do it. But, I mean, going 10-2 and two, two times out of the last three years, they have a chance to win 11 games in a season for the first time in their history this season. Uh, I, I mean, Lane Kiffin has Ole Miss in a B-plus version of the Johnny Vault glory years with what they're pulling off in Oxford right now. And honestly, they've paid Lane Kiffin as much as he needs to pay. The Venn diagram of places that Lane Kiffin can even go to or would go to is so small, Ole Miss is almost out of the woods on this avenue as well. It, it is amazing uh, what he's done. You take out that five and five year in, in the COVID year and you're one, but uh, what is it, 27 and 10 in his last three seasons here, a chance to go 28 and 10 and then maybe a bowl win. It uh, It is phenomenal, and there's a reason why you know teams have flirted with Lane and, and why he still is viewed as one of those hot names that every time the coaching carousel comes around that, that he's going to be looking, uh, where are Ole Miss fans on, Ole Miss, on, on Lane Kiffin? Because I know some were very perturbed with him in the Auburn rumors a year ago. And some of the Ole Miss fans perspective was, are we really going to do this every year? If you're going to go, just go ahead and go. Um, some were stood by him and said, we love Lane. We're going to enjoy it. Where are Ole Miss fans on Kiffin? Um, I think a lot of Ole Miss fans, including myself, had to come to terms with the fact that Lane Kiffin is just SEO catnip, basically. It, it, whenever you put his name in a headline, it, it doesn't matter. It's going to get more clicks than if you didn't. So at the beginning, we were like, okay, Lane Kiffin is putting his name into every job out there. And then after about three years, we we're like, well, other than the Auburn job, how real was any of those? How, you know, We've seen stories about media members doing things for clicks and things like that, and we started digging down into it. I, th I think there's one or two jobs that I'm genuinely concerned about if they come open, but like Wayne isn't going to Texas A&M. That would be the worst fit in the history of fits. Wayne's too smart to do that. Um, there's a couple of places that you probably legit need to be worried about, but 
until Michigan. No, the I, none of the cold weather jobs I would worry about. I, honestly, I think if Miami, if Mario Cristobal um, was gone, that would be the number one job that I would worry about in the future. But that's that's down the road, man. It, it is interesting that the A and M thing I only thought was intriguing from this standpoint. And we know they could pay him a an ungodly amount of money, but what was Lane's quote after the loss to Georgia was, "We got to recruit better." The one thing AM has not had a problem with is getting five star recruits in there because they got NIL money and all that. That was the only thing I thought, but everything else, you're right. Yell practice, hmm. all that kind of stuff. That's not lame. Yeah. In a situation, whenever he says stuff like that after the Georgia game, that isn't to everybody complaining about Ole Miss. That's to the Ole Miss fan base to donate to the NIL collective. Right. It, it, that, that is all him recruiting. That isn't him looking for an excuse to get out. We're having to learn essentially how Lane works on a lot of stuff like this to where, you know, you have to have that alert. Are, do we need to be worried about that comment? Okay, no, that's that's not a real thing. He's doing this. And I think it's interesting that this week for the very first time, Lane's talked about the importance of the Egg Bowl game. Yeah. Um, the, the quarterback, Jackson Darts, talked about this game. There's rumors of Lane Kiffin being invested into the Oxford community more so than he has in the last three years. And I always say that when it comes to the Egg Bowl game, until you lose it the first time, you don't know how much it means. It's just another game until you lose that football game. And then after he lost last year to Mike Leach, God rest his soul, um, there's probably a little bit of meaning that was put in, especially now that Lane's doing a lot of work in the high school field. There's a lot of high school recruits in Mississippi, and you're going to see them take this game a lot more serious. The rumor is last week, and it's just the rumor. I don't know. I haven't really heard anything concrete about it. Is Ole Miss spent about a half a practice on Louisiana Monroe the whole time. Otherwise, was on Mississippi State. One more thing before we get into the, this Egg Bowl matchup. Uh, I don't know if Lane slipped up. I don't know what, you know, about a week ago on his coach's show, he mentioned Jackson Dart is coming back next year. Now, I, I don't know, you know, where he would have ranked among all the uh, draft-eligible quarterbacks. And, you know, certainly the transfer portal is always churning. He brought in Spencer Sanders a year ago. People thought he was going to be the starter. But um, big deal for Ole Miss if Jackson Dart is indeed coming back for next season, right? Yes, I, and I do think Jackson Dart is coming back, but I do think that Lane kind of spoke out of turn because Jackson Dart has earned the right to make that announcement whenever he's ready to say he is or he isn't coming back. Put out the ad at the whole nine yards. I do think Jackson's coming back because this quarterback class is just absolutely stacked. You're looking at Jackson Dart could come out as a really good player and you're going to get drafted in the fifth or sixth round or undrafted or anything like that. And if you come back next year, Mike Dettelier on the Bow Bound show in Mississippi came out and said, if Jackson Dart comes back next year, he has a chance to have a Jaden Daniels type ascendancy in his senior year. And I agree with that. Everybody saw the jump that Jackson Dart made from a sophomore to a junior. What does Jackson Dart look like from a junior to a senior? You're talking about an Ole Miss team that is on the precipice of the 12-team playoff, and they're going to be all over the discussion in 2024, regardless, with Quinshawn coming back, Jackson Dark coming back. I'm assuming Ole Miss needs to go out and find a number one wide receiver because I am going to assume that Trey Harris is probably going to go be the next Ole Miss wide receiver to get drafted in the second round. And, and you're going to have that situation. The defense is going to be a ton better. Ole Miss probably has the top defensive line class in the country. Um, Pete Golding has it going on that side of the ball as well. There's a couple of games this year against LSU in Georgia that, you know, the transfers, they just kind of got outmatched a little bit defensively. But against good to mid offenses, Ole Miss has feasted this year. They've had five games where they've given up less than 300 yards to teams. So we'll we'll see how that goes. I'm pretty excited, but I do think Jackson Dart has earned the right to make the announcement himself, and I'm glad that Lane Cliff Kiffin kind of walked it back. It is a Thanksgiving edition of Locked On, and uh, what will it take for Ole Miss to win this Egg Bowl? We'll discuss that next with Stephen Willis. All right, let's get into it with Stephen Willis, host of Locked On Ole Miss. And uh, Stephen, as we look at this matchup in the Egg Bowl, um, you know, look, it's easy to say Ole Miss, heavy favorite, the run game with Quinchon Judkins, the passing game with 
Trey Harris and Dayton Wade and Jordan Watkins and all these guys. And, uh, you know, easy to think Ole Miss is going to overwhelm Mississippi State. However, State, I know they fired Zach Arnett. Uh, Coach Knox has done a pretty good job. That they, they looked really good against Southern Miss, and they're getting healthy now. Will Rogers back in there solidifies that offense, gives them a chance in this game. Tulu Griffin, Woody Marks, so many different weapons. Um, you know, kind of bad timing for Ole Miss that Mississippi State is getting healthy at the right time for this one. Yeah, and 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 you're right. Will Rogers and Woody Marks and that and Woody Marks actually took a knock against Southern Miss. So I do not know how healthy he'd be, but I would assume since it is the bowl or bust game, he is going to play. Tua Griffin, Xavion Harris, there's there's some good players. But um on my show today, I put it out there as like, you know, there's not a player that plays for Mississippi State that would start for Ole Miss in that position offensively. And so you have good players, but it's relatively good players. And I do not believe in the rival game. Anything can happen or throw out the record books. I don't believe in that stuff. I think that that is something that is put out by the underdog to make the favorite play down to them. Um, and if Ole Miss comes out and plays clean in this football game, I think Ole Miss is going to win the football game. And if you talk to Mississippi State fans around Mississippi, they're all talking like 38 to 17, 38 to 21. That is what Mississippi State writers are thinking is going on. We'll see what happens. Ole Miss fans doesn't normally travel very well to David Wade Stadium. They just the rivalry where they hate each other. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of stuff on Twitter hitting me up of people going up and spending Thanksgiving night in Davis Wade as Ole Miss fans. And you might have a decent little contingent for that game. The uh, one, you know, I, I'll, I'll say this. I mean, what was last year's game? Like 24-22. So, mm. you know, the Mississippi State's defense did a good job of uh, holding Ole Miss, you know, down and scoring. I think if that happens, that's the path for a victory for Mississippi State is keep this thing low scoring, uh, keep it kind of sloppy, that sort of thing. Um, you know, outside of uh, wide receivers faking like they're peeing on a fire hydrant, uh, some crazy things could happen in this one. I do like the Mississippi State linebackers, though. Bookie Watson and, and Jet Johnson are two of the best in the in the in the SEC. And obviously, uh Jet Johnson with an opportunity here to be the leading tackler on tonight could be the leading tackler in back-to-back -back seasons in the SEC. And that's just crazy to think. But uh you agree like Mississippi State's path for a win here is keep this thing low scoring? Yes, it needs to be low scoring. If Ole Miss has some operational stuff, they do not play clean. I think that Mississippi State needs um to be helped in this football game, whether we're talking about a kick return for a touchdown, a couple of turnovers, something like that, to get put some energy into that place. Because Greg Knox, as an interim coach, is basically your whole goal is emotion. You, everything is off of emotion. So the first five minutes of the game, you've got that covered. The emotion for that is going to be taken care of. It is Greg Knox's job to find a way to make it to where you can have emotion for the second five minutes of the game for the third five minutes of the game, and then eventually get into a ball game because there's a very real possibility, and I do not know that it's going to happen, but it's, it's real because Lane Kiffin is one of the best script writers in all of college football to where Ole Miss goes straight down the field, scores a touchdown, they get the ball back, go straight down and score a touchdown, it's 14 to nothing, and then we're kind of on quit watch because we've all seen an interim coach type situation. Uh, one Quick rewind to last week. Uh, it was funny because, you know, there was Cupcake Week in the SEC, and I'm scoreboard watching, and I had the game on, but I wasn't paying attention to it. Why was it only 7-3 to three at half? Just lack of execution in the first half against Louisiana Monroe? Like I, like I said um, earlier in the interview, that there's a rumor that is out there that Ole Miss spent half of one practice on Louisiana Monroe that week. <laughs> and they just kind of reacted to what Louisiana was doing and schematically. And once Ole Miss got into halftime, to where they actually could sit down and draw some stuff up for a couple of minutes. All of a sudden, it was a 28 um, nothing third quarter, and the game was essentially over. It, it, I think it was a situation that Ole Miss was never losing to Louisiana Monroe. Uh, I mean, we weren't, we're not going to have a situation of New Mexico State in that situation because New Mexico State's just a better football team. Um, but I will say this about Louisiana Monroe. They got a little bit of confidence at the end of the game. They, they were never scoring a touchdown in that game, but they got a little bit of confidence. They, they felt go, good going into the locker room, um, but once it happened, it happened. I, I, I genuinely think um, the team and everybody, they've been focused on Mississippi State for two weeks. All right, give me your uh, score prediction. How do you see this one playing out tonight? 
Um, I think it's 38-14. I think it's a situation to where um, Ole Miss comes out, gets the ball. They're probably going to take it to start the game. Um, they need to be on onside kick watch for the opening kickoff, in my opinion. But they go down, score a touchdown. They get a stop. They score another touchdown. All of a sudden, it's 14 to nothing. State kind of lays down just a little bit. They're kind of watching the end of the season. Ole Miss ends up winning the game 38 to 14. Let me hit you with a quick couple of other other uh, SEC quick hitters, Stephen. While we got you, um, you saw Jaden Daniels firsthand in in that game in Oxford and and go toe to toe with Ole Miss and what he's done all year. Uh, no disrespect to Bo Nix and Michael Penix, they've had awesome years. In my opinion, Jaden Daniels has been the best player in college football. He deserves to win the Heisman. Where are you on the Heisman? He he's Johnny Football. That that's what he is. He's Johnny Football. You can't stop the guy. He's amazing. He's the best player in college football. And yeah, he need why is he not treated like Johnny Football when Johnny Football was when right. they are essentially the same player? And honestly, we're going to be real about something here. Jaden Daniels is probably a better passer than Johnny Manziel. Yeah. And yeah, it's been 10 years but oh so people have forgot the narrative has been established that the West Coast should win all the awards. And all of that, and it, it it's ridiculous. The West Coast, the Pac-12 has turned out, you know, other than Oregon and Washington got that win, the rest of the leagues kind of turned out to be fraudulent. Yeah, uh, it, it it just kind of became what we thought they were going to be, and because of that, I think Jaden Daniels kind of falls victim to Michael Penix and Bo Nix because the narrative has already been established that the Pac-12 is the best conference in football. Meanwhile, the SEC deserves four teams in the twelve-team playoff. Period. <laughs> or the, the the twelve team the access balls they they do. Do you um one other hitter for you? Anybody on upset alert this weekend? I I was all ready to go on in, all in on Auburn in the in the uh, Iron Bowl, but man, losing to New Mexico State, it's hard to see them beating Alabama this week. Oh yeah, um, upset alert probably Louisville. Um, Louisville's had trouble beating Kentucky in that rivalry, so there's probably some scar tissue going on. Um, I, I, I would look at that. I, I think the Iron Bowl has a chance to just get ugly. The only thing that's going to save Hugh Freeze in that game is the fact that Alabama plays so slow offensively now that they just don't put up points like they used to. Uh, yeah. it, and it's and, Jordan uh, Hare. Crazy things. that They played Georgia close earlier this year, Jordan Hare. So. Yeah, yeah, Alabama needs to look out to where they don't play down to the competition enough to where that weirdness can happen. You yeah. need, yeah, yeah. It, that that's going to be the whole key. I, I mean, Auburn's going to decide to muck up the gears in that game because that's their their best chance. They can play defense pretty well, you know. Maybe they can stop the run game. It, 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 Alabama has to figure out a way to separate in this game because if it gets in the third quarter, the fourth quarter, the magic of Jordan Harris can take over, and all of a sudden, the Hugh Freeze has beat Nick Saban two times. Right. You'll start hearing all of that. <laughs> Hugh Freeze has beaten Nick Saban twice, but he's also lost to Vandy twice and New Mexico State twice. Yeah. <laughs> Last thing for you, Stephen. Give me an early look ahead at the SEC championship game. I, I The more I keep looking at it, look, Bama's Bama. Nick Saban's done a great job, but Georgia is just – they're on another level, man. When they flip yeah. that switch, they, they, nobody can beat them. Hey, I, I, I was watching the game that night whenever Georgia decided, hey, we're going to come out and play football. <laughs> and – they just turned into a rolling ball of butcher. Not, nobody's beating that team. The only yeah. team that has a chance to beat them is Alabama, just because there's 78 four- and five-star players on that roster. But I don't think Alabama, as good as Jalen Milrow is, I don't know if they can score enough because the dirty secret that teams have after they watch Georgia play is this isn't a defensive football team. This is an elite offensive football team. And that, if you just think about what that means, that is absolutely scary. I cannot wait to see Georgia 50-burger Michigan in the college football playoff. Last thing for you, uh, who's your SEC coach of the year? I, I've got Eli Drinkwitz. I think what he's done there is phenomenal. Chance of 10 wins and Brady Cook and Cody Schrader leading the SEC in rushing and all that. I could hear a case for Lane. I could hear a case for Saban and, and Kirby. Saban and Kirby, though, they're always working with a loaded deck with top two recruiting classes. So I've got Drink. Who, who's your SEC coach of the year? It, it, you know, um, ask me after this weekend, honestly, because you're right, it is Lane or Eli. Um, but how does Missouri do down in Fayetteville? That can be a weird place. 
Yeah. And um, Sam Pittman getting his real – he's coming back next year. Everybody's probably going to be up a little bit. And, you know, Florida was a fourth and 17 miracle away from beating Missouri on Saturday. It, so, it, it's a weird situation. By the way, I feel bad for the fans of Florida and Florida State because what was going to be a pretty big football game is just now backup quarterback central. Yeah. And probably Florida State's not going to the playoff now. And – Florida, after the thing against Missouri, they they probably have to win the game, but that game has a chance to get weird. I talked to Brian Smith, by the way, who does some stuff. He says after um, Jordan Travis, Florida State doesn't have much at quarterback, and so I'm curious about that. Yeah, Rowan, Roden, Rowan, Henry Rowan Gardner, I think it's the guy's yeah. name, whatever it is. He is Stephen Willis of uh, Locked Out Ole Miss. Let everybody know where they can find your stuff, man. Hey, it's the Locked On Ole podcast. It's on YouTube. It's also available wherever you get your podcast. You can follow me on social media at the Stephen Willis. You can follow me on Instagram at LO Ole Miss. And um, please do that as well. Should be a lot of fun. Anyway, I'm just really th- excited. It's Thanksgiving, and I hope <laughs> that everybody enjoys the game tonight. I thought you said I'm really fat. I'm like, I'm about to be that way too. I'm going to eat yeah. the crap out of some turkey. I'm oh, going to yeah. enjoy it's some Thanksgiving. Apple. Yeah, it's, it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> He is Stephen Willis. Check him out on uh, Locked on Ole Miss. Stephen, thanks for the time, man. Appreciate it. Not a problem at all. And take care, Chris. All right. Uh, thank you guys for making us your first listen every day here on Locked on SEC. And now for your second listen, a reminder, Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. They're here for you covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked on, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked on Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 seven streaming channel. I'm Chris Gordy. This has been locked on SEC. Shout out to our everydayers. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.